if you can stay with me as we work through the introduction, it's going to help you put together your New, your New Testament, similar to the way in which we put together the Old Testament by working through a book like Ezra, okay? And so if, stay with me. If you, if, we, if you work at it, if you think through with it, me with it, it's going to help you put together your New Testament. It's also going to help prepare you for our next study together. And so hang in there, okay? And if you need to... Write the text down, think through it with me, and then this will be on recording so you can go back and listen to it again if that will help you, okay? So before we get started, let's pray together. Father in heaven, almighty God, Lord, we thank you for the joy and the blessed privilege of studying your revelation to us, your word. Uh, Thank you, Lord, for the grace that is ours in Christ to lay our supplications before you, uh, knowing, Lord, that you condescend to hear our prayer, uh, that you condescend to attend to our great need in the preaching of your word by your spirit. We thank you for that. Uh, Spirit of God, uh, we acknowledge our need before you this morning and ask for your help. Uh, Please, Lord, uh, attend to the preaching of your word. Uh, Guide us into truth. Uh, Glorify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Uh, Grip our hearts with the joy that is ours in him by faith and cause us, Lord, to exult in praise and worship uh, to you, our triune God, uh, for this great salvation that has been given to us. Uh, Prepare us, Lord, as we work through this introduction this morning, prepare us for the study that is coming and our verse-by-verse journey through your word in that study. And please, Lord, work in our hearts this morning to glorify your name. Uh, For those who don't know you, Lord, cause them to be born again. And for the saints, Lord, uh, cause us to flee our sin and draw near to you, our refuge. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your word. Um, Bless your word to our hearts now as we study in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. According to the end of the gospel accounts. We just finished the gospel of John, and so that's essentially where we'll begin today. According to the end of the gospel accounts, the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ leaves the disciples discouraged and demoralized. John's gospel records that after the Lord's death, the disciples are assembled together in a locked down room in Jerusalem for fear of the Jews. In Luke 24, on the road to Emmaus, The risen Lord encounters two followers of Christ, saddened by the Lord's death. Their hopes are dashed, they're demoralized, and they said to him as they walked together, we were hoping that it was he who is going to redeem Israel. The women are the first to see the Lord alive after his resurrection. And many of the disciples refuse to believe their account. Luke says to the eleven Uh, that the words of the women seemed like idle tales to them. And after the women, however, the Lord graciously and gloriously appears to the eleven as well in numerous recorded post-resurrection appearances. And not only to the eleven, not only to the eleven, Paul records that at one point, the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to more than 500 disciples together at one time, many of whom, he said, are alive and well as the New Testament church is being established and as the New Testament documents are being written. Now, there were several reasons that we gave for these post-resurrection appearances of Christ. First, they're for the purpose of attesting to the fact that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead in power. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus Christ is the one who became flesh, God who became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ conquered the grave. He redeemed his people. God's wrath has been satisfied. God's justice has been vindicated. And Jesus is the first fruits of all those who have fallen asleep. All of us who will fall asleep. And as all of us die in Adam, even so in Christ, all shall be made alive. Amen? And the resurrection proves that in power. Uh, Secondly, the second reason for these post-resurrection appearances is the Lord used those appearances to encourage and strengthen beleaguered disciples. From the gospel accounts, we see the Lord instructing them. The Lord is correcting them, sometimes rebuking them. 
In all of this, the Lord is primarily preparing them for gospel ministry. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ will go out to all the world, to the ends of the earth. And it's going to go out initially through the testimony, the attestation of these apostolic witnesses. So the Lord intends to strengthen these men. It will be the truth of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ that would fuel the relentless preaching of the gospel by the disciples in the early church. And the early church would grow at the preaching of Jesus Christ and him crucified and raised from the dead. Thirdly, in these post-resurrection appearances, the Lord commissions the disciples and he commissions all disciples that come after them. He commissions them to be a witness for him. Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 18. The Lord Jesus Christ says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We see this great commission given again to the disciples by the Lord himself in Acts chapter 1. Turn to Acts chapter 1 with me. Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. Again, the great commission given, beginning in verse 4, where... Luke records, being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But, verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. The promised Spirit descends in power upon the disciples gathered, gathered together in Jerusalem at Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2. Flip over to Acts chapter 2 with me and look at verse 1. Now when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were, dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. And then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes, the Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God." That day, in Jerusalem, about 3,000 souls were added to their number, and from the womb of eternal electing grace, the church was birthed in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit had descended with power for the purpose of witness. These disciples were to remain in Jerusalem. They will be witnesses to him in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The Bible says that those new disciples, the new disciples of the church in Jerusalem, went everywhere preaching the gospel. All over Jerusalem, all over Judea, all over Samaria in Acts 8 we see, and to the end of the earth. Preaching in their own languages, in their own languages, the crucified and risen Christ. Now that upstart movement 
often called the way in the early church. That upstart movement that the Jews had thought they would squash by murdering its leader, that upstart movement began to spread like wildfire. The Jewish leaders were astounded by the boldness of the Lord's disciples. Now that's a boldness, you understand, that is fueled by the Spirit of God, informed by the truth of the reality of the resurrection. The Lord Jesus Christ, Him crucified and Him raised from the dead. The Lord Jesus Christ is risen, amen? And in the Spirit of God, in that truth, that truth, the Spirit of God fueled their preaching. And the Jewish leaders were astounded. They preached with boldness. They preached fiery, right? They preached the Word of God. The Jews saw that these men were untrained. They were uneducated, but they knew they had been with Jesus. And Jerusalem, they said, was being filled with their doctrine. The gates of Hades were not prevailing against the spread of the gospel. The Jews marveled at the miracles being performed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were dumbfounded as Jews by the thousands swelled the ranks of the early church, repenting of their sin and putting their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter stood up in the middle of a meeting of the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 4, preaching Christ. In the presence of the very men who led the charge to murder Christ, Peter said of Christ in verse 11, in Acts chapter 4, verse 11, this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And as the gospel began to spread, as the early church was being built, the Jewish leaders began to panic. What are we going to do? What shall we do? So inevitably, as the church began to spread, persecution begins to ramp up. Disciples of the way begin to be rounded up, begin to be imprisoned, beaten, and killed. The first of the early church to be martyred for preaching the gospel was Stephen over in Acts chapter 7. And there at the very end of the chapter, we're introduced to a man who had proved to be a violent and zealous enemy of the church, Saul of Tarsus. Look at, with me at, at Acts chapter 7, verse 57. Where Luke records, then they cried out with a loud voice. They stopped their ears at the preaching of Stephen, and they ran at Stephen with one accord. And they cast him out of the city, and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. If you look at chapter 8, verse 1, Saul was there consenting to his death. Saul set the bar in his zealous persecution of the church. He would say of himself in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, that he himself was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, the chief of sinners having persecuted the church. And persecuting the church to death, he intended to bring back disciples of the way, imprisoned, bound to Jerusalem, where Paul would later say that he sat in judgment, consenting to their death. Concerning the law, Paul said, he was a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, he persecuted the church. Now Paul, still breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, when the ascended Christ met him on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. The growing persecution in Jerusalem had fueled a diaspora, a scattering of Christian Jews. Literally, these people were fleeing for their lives. They were leaving behind possessions. They were leaving behind work. Leaving behind loved ones. Forsaking all for the Lord Jesus Christ. And everywhere they went, they were preaching the gospel. However, as the witness for Christ moved beyond the walls of Jerusalem, the persecution also followed them. One such group of persecuted Christians had established themselves in Damascus, about 135 miles north of Jerusalem. And square in the sights of the church's most fearsome enemy. If you look on your map there, you can see, if I can point this thing right, 
Damascus here, Jerusalem to the south, about 135 miles north is Damascus. This is Judea. I'll give you an idea. This is modern day Turkey. Here is modern day Israel. You've got Syria to the north. This is Cappadocia. You've got Asia here, Bithynia here, Galatia through here. We'll talk about that more in a moment. But as the persecuted Christians fled the city of Jerusalem, they fled into outlying areas, and as they fled, witnessing for Christ, persecution followed them. Look at Acts chapter 9, and look at verse 1. Then Saul, still breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, he went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And then he fell to the ground. He heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Notice he said persecuting him. Right? Persecution of the church is persecution of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said in verse 5, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And immediately Saul is humbled before the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The Lord instructs then Ananias, a disciple of Christ. He instructs him to meet Saul in Damascus and he tells him down in verse 15, go Ananias, for Saul is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. That's what it means to be an apostle. (laughs) How many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Saul was filled with the Spirit of God. Saul was given his apostolic charge in Acts chapter 9. Saul was strengthened with a little food in Acts chapter 9. Look down at verse 20. And immediately, Saul preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. He confounded Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Saul, also uh, known by his Roman name Paul, becomes a bold herald of the gospel. Before this chapter is out, what happens? The Jews are seen plotting, watching day and night to kill him. Now, if we trace a chronology then of Paul's ministry from here, we can draw that from various texts in his letters. Flip over quickly with me to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. And let's put together a chronology of Paul's ministry. We know that from Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, that Paul spent three years in Arabia... And that three years ended with a trip to Jerusalem to meet with Peter. Look at Galatians chapter 1 and look at verse 15. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned to Damascus. Now, Arabia... If here's Damascus, Arabia is this region to the east. So we went into the desert. There's a desert there, right? Paul goes into Arabia. Verse 18, then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed before God, I do not lie. So Paul, after meeting with the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, he goes into Damascus and then takes a right. You know, the guys were giving me a hard time with this pointer, saying we're becoming emergent now. I have a laser pointer and we're doing that. <laughs> so, we just need a candle. We need a candle on the pulpit. <laughs> this is a multimedia presentation this morning. So, uh, <laughs> so here's Damascus. He goes into the desert in Arabia. He spends essentially uh, three years in Arabia, right? Afterward, it says, Paul goes up into the regions of Cilicia and Syria, according to Galatians 
So Cilicia, if you travel north from Damascus, Cilicia is this region here, or Syria is this region here. This is called Antioch of Syria. And Cilicia is up here. Tarsus, Paul's hometown, is right here on the coast. So Tarsus down here, that makes sense. You can sketch that out and write these in if you want to, if that, if that helps you, or I can give you a copy of this map. So afterward, Paul goes into the, the regions of Cilicia and Syria, according to Galatians 1.21. Acts 11.25, if you go back to Acts, Acts 11.25 records the church sending out Barnabas, sending out Barnabas, who goes to Tarsus in Cilicia to find Paul. Now he finds Paul in Tarsus, Paul had returned to his hometown, essentially. Barnabas goes, finds, finds him in Tarsus, and then he returns and brings him back to Antioch in Syria, where Paul and Barnabas then meet with the church there for a year, teaching the people. They spend a year in Antioch, teaching the people. Antioch becomes a, whole, a home base, so to speak, for Paul's missionary journeys. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Okay? Between the two, between... Tarsus, Cilicia, Syria, between Arabia and then back in Antioch, Paul spent 14 years. It was a period that ended with another trip to Jerusalem, uh, this time with help from the church at Antioch to help the, the church in Jerusalem with famine relief, right? And Antioch would then become a home base for Paul's missionary journeys. Now, based on some fixed dates or fixed clues in Acts chapter 18... One of those being a, a decree from the emperor Claudius that all Jews were to leave Rome. Another being the rule of Gallio as proconsul of Achaia. Those clues in Acts 18 help us pinpoint historical dates here for the ministry of Paul. We can estimate from those dates that Paul was likely converted on the road to Damascus in 34 AD, the year after the Lord's crucifixion. Paul then went on to Tarsus in 37 AD, where he was found by Barnabas and taken to Antioch. Paul was then at the church in Antioch in 48 AD, all this comprising 14 years when the Spirit of God set him apart for missionary work in Acts 13. Look at Acts 13 with me. In Acts 13, Paul and Barnabas and others are serving in the church at Antioch in Syria. They're preaching the gospel, teaching the people. When in verse 1, Acts records that now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul... For the work to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent Barnabas and Saul away. What would follow then is a description of Paul's first missionary journey through the region of Galatia, which is this region here. So, Paul's going to go through Galatia preaching the gospel. The terrain of Galatia was incredibly rough on foot. Rivers, swamps, mountains. And Paul was likely thinking of segments of this trip when he writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that once he was stoned, that happened in Lystra, in Galatia, he was in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of his own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils in the wilderness, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and in thirst, in fastings often, in cold and in nakedness. Now why? Why would Paul go through all that? Because of the preaching of the gospel. He had been called to preach the gospel. He was going to be obedient to the call even at the cost of his own life. And he loved those people. He wanted to see them saved. And many of the Jews, as he was preaching, many of the Jews rejected the gospel at every turn, such that Paul and Barnabas then turned their attention to the Gentiles. Drop down to Acts chapter 13 and look at verse 44. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. 
But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Because that's the same sin that led the Jews in Jerusalem to crucify Christ. Right? He said it was because of envy that they delivered him up. They were contradicting, verse 45, and blaspheming, and they opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas, verse 46, they grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Again, this, this act, further judgment on the Jews for their rejection of their Messiah, for their rejection of the gospel. Now be warned. This is a warning to you and I in our day. The same judgment takes place in the hearing of the gospel today. Jesus warns his hearers in Luke chapter 8, verse 18. He says, Therefore, take heed how you hear. For whoever has, to him more will be given. And whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken from him. The warning is this. If you continue to reject Christ, if you continue to reject the gospel, reject the command to repent and believe, if you continue to carelessly live your life with no concern for God's word, with no concern for the truth of the gospel, no concern with what the word of God says about your soul, right? No concern for what God says about your sin, and you just continue to persist in your sin, then your heart grows harder and harder. Your self-justifying, deceptive heart will convince you that somehow you're okay, that you can have your cake and eat it too, and you'll grow harder and harder and harder toward the things of God. The truth of God, the truth of the gospel, Forgiveness of sins, mercy in Christ, forgiveness in Christ, that truth slips farther and farther and farther away, farther and farther from your touch as you become harder and harder and harder. And ultimately, you find yourself before the judgment bar of Almighty God, the great white throne, with no hope. That hope of everlasting life that was once presented to you, now gone, and you were lost. If you don't take heed how you hear, even what you seem to have will be taken from you. The Jews, harder and harder and harder, and eventually persecuting those of the way, persecuting those who preach the gospel. The Lord Jesus Christ comes to you now with good news, amen? He comes to you with good news, forgiveness in Christ. Turn from your sin and put your faith and trust in him and be forgiven. The Jews here in Acts 13 just continue to reject Jesus as the Christ. And so eventually in judgment, Paul just shakes the dust off his clothes and said, I give you up. Give you up to your sin. Give you up to the hardness of your hearts. And we turn to the Gentiles. You don't want the Lord doing that with you in a personal way, right? When you continue to reject the gospel and eventually you're just given over, as Paul says in Romans 1, to a debased mind. To do those things which you want to do. Have at it, right? Turn from your sin. So here in Acts 13, Paul turns his attention to the Gentiles. Look at verse 47. Because, Paul says, the Lord has commanded us I have set you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. This gospel is going to go out to Gentiles. This gospel is going to go out for the salvation to the ends of the earth. Verse 48. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad. They glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. It's a profound statement of the electing grace and mercy of God. As many of those in that region of Galatia, and there were many, as many of those who were God's people, whose names had been written in the book of life from before the foundation of the world, as many of those as there were, as many of those had, who had been appointed to eternal life, those believed at the preaching of Paul, at the preaching of Barnabas. But concluding his first missionary journey through Galatia, this area, again, here, Paul writes the letter to the Galatians around AD 49, around 50 AD, 
after returning to Antioch in Syria. After his first missionary journey, Paul travels back to Antioch and he writes the letter to the Galatians. From Paul's letter to the Galatians, we know that false teaching immediately creeps in. Comes through creeps who creep in and immediately becomes a problem. The gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, was immediately challenged, immediately corrupted by Judaizers who wanted to add works to salvation, specifically circumcision, the feast days. So between his first and second missionary journeys then, Paul takes a trip to Jerusalem in Acts 15 for the Jerusalem Council, and it's for the purpose of clearing up the error of the Judaizers once and for all. There at the council in Jerusalem, the council affirms the true gospel, affirms salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. Just ask the disciples of the way, be sensitive to some of the Jewish customs that they had. Nevertheless, faith alone in Christ alone. And then in AD 50, 50 AD, Paul takes Silas now and begins the second of his third or his three missionary journeys. They're on their second missionary journey. This begins in Acts chapter 15 in verse 36. In Acts 15, 36, Paul decides to begin his second missionary journey by going back through Syria, back through Cilicia, back through Galatia, strengthening the churches that had been planted there. Paul and Silas meet Timothy in Lystra, and Timothy joins them. Now it's it's interesting then, what happens next? The Bible says that as they are preaching through Galatia, that the Spirit of God in Acts 15, the Spirit of God prevents them from going into Bithynia, Pontus, this area to the north. The Spirit of God prevents them from going into Asia, this area here. So the only direction left for them to go is from Galatia into what's called Mysia, this northern area here. And so what does Paul and Silas do? They go into Mysia to preach the gospel. Prevented from going here, prevented from going here. So they go between the two into Mysia, right? As they go, the only route available to them, they go over Mysia to the port city of Troas, which is around here. Port city of Troas. And this is where Paul receives what is known as the Macedonian call. You see the Macedonian call in Acts chapter 16, verse 8. Acts chapter 16, verse 8. He has a vision in the night of a man of Macedonia, pleading with him to come over and help them in Macedonia. Macedonia is this region here. Paul is in Tarsus. Here's Macedonia, okay? He gets the Macedonian call. So Paul, Silas, and Timothy, understanding that being God's direction to them, they immediately head for Macedonia. They travel immediately from Troas. They spend one night here on this island called Samothrace. They immediately go over here. They land at Neapolis. In Neapolis, they pick up Luke. They meet Luke in Neapolis. And then they immediately go to Philippi, which is about right there. If I can hold that still. <laughs> And Philippi was considered the capital, of a, of the capital of Macedonia, capital city of Macedonia, this region here, right? So they immediately go to Philippi. Paul, in Acts 16 and 17, plants a church in Philippi, plants a church in Thessalonica, and plants a church in Berea, right here along this, sort of along the coastline, but a little bit inward, inland from that. They leave, Paul leaves Silas, leaves Timothy behind in Berea, And Paul departs Macedonia, this area here. He departs for the south and comes down. Eventually, he's going to wind up in Athens, which is about right there. Right? And this is the region of Achaia. Achaia and Corinth was the capital city of Achaia. Athens right here on the coast. Okay? So, we know from Acts 17, Paul preaches the gospel to the pagans on Mars Hill at the Areopagus in Athens. And then he ends up traveling from Athens west to Corinth, where in Corinth he spends about 18 months preaching the gospel between 50 and 52 AD. And that's recorded for us in Acts 18. Look at Acts 18. Paul plants the church there at Corinth. Acts 18, verse 1. 
After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. And that was because Emperor Claudius had issued an edict that all the Jews were to leave Rome. Right? So you can imagine, right? Priscilla and Aquila then forced out of their home, forced out of Rome, and they came to Corinth. Verse 3. So, because Paul was of the same trade, Paul stayed with them and worked. Priscilla and Aquila were also tent makers, leather workers like Paul. Their occupation, verse 3, they were also tent makers. Verse 4, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Paul went first to the synagogue there, persuading both Jews and Greeks in the synagogue. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia... Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, see the pattern again? He shook his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. So justice gets converted. Then Crispus, verse 8, the ruler of the synagogue, the administrator of the synagogue, so to speak, he believed on the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. And a church in Corinth was planted. Amen? Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. He said to Paul, verse 9, Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent. The Lord would say that to you, brother, sister, right? Don't be afraid. Speak, and do not be silent. What is it that keeps our mouths shut but fear? Fear of man, right? If you, or unbelief. Fear or unbelief. The Lord says, speak. Do not be afraid. Open your mouth. Preach the gospel. Speak to them. Don't be silent. Verse 10, for I am with you. He says in Matthew 28, lo, even to the end of the age, no one will attack you or hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And Paul continued there, verse 11, a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Again, clear evidence of the elect mercies of God in the city of Corinth. The Lord has many people in Orlando, amen? Many people in Orlando. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Do not be silent. Don't be afraid, but speak. It's awesome to be used of God in that, right? To preach the gospel to lost people. And God has many whom he will save. The city of Corinth, again, was the Roman capital of Achaia, this area here, comprising just the north of this area. This is Achaia. And the city of Corinth is the capital of Achaia. It's about 55 miles west of Athens. It's on an isthmus. That's not easy to say. This little strip of land, uh, they called it the Bridge of Greece. Probably because bridge was e- easier to say than isthmus. Okay. Um, but it's on this tiny section of land here between the mainland and the peninsula. Okay. Corinth was an important, because of its location, an important trade center in the first century. A center of government, a a center of politics, a center, because of the trade, a center of economics. Had a population of about 80,000. And like many commercial centers today, you had those in Corinth who were extremely wealthy and those in Corinth who were extremely poor. Luke describes in Acts 18, you have Jews there who were like Crispus, who was the ruler of the synagogue, And then you had struggling Jewish exiles like Priscilla and Aquila from Rome who were tent makers like Paul. However, based on many of the problems in the church recorded in 1 Corinthians, it appears as though the church was largely comprised of Gentile believers, mostly Gentiles in the church in Corinth. After Paul leaves Corinth and concludes his second missionary campaign, Problems begin to plague the church in Corinth. Reports begin to filter into Paul during his three-year stay in Ephesus. On his third missionary journey, he comes to Ephesus. He 
according to Acts 20, he spends three years in Ephesus. As he's in Ephesus, reports begin to filter into Paul about the church at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians, turn over to 1 Corinthians with me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, down in verse 11, Chloe's people begin to report to Paul that there are divisions in the church. Many are prideful in the church over their wealth, over their stature. Others are poor. Gross sexual immorality has been reported to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. These reports begin to come into Paul of problems with the church at Corinth. The Corinthians are confused about marriage, confused about divorce and singleness. We know that from chapter 7. The paganism in the city has raised questions of Christian liberty that Paul has to deal with in chapter 8. There are differences of wealth, differences of standing in the church. They've caused problems with how the Corinthians observe the Lord's Supper. And Paul has to deal with that in chapter 11. There's confusion over spiritual gifts. There's false teaching in the church about the resurrection. There's over-realized eschatology, problems with that in the church at Corinth. The city of Corinth, so amongst the problems in the church at Corinth, the city of Corinth was so given over to immorality, to debauchery, that it became known throughout the Roman Empire that to Corinthianize meant to give yourself over to your lusts. That was the name for it, to Corinthianize. The Corinthians became known for that. Anyone who went there often went there for that purpose. These difficulties in the church, in the area, contribute to Paul's deep concern for the churches that he mentions in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He had deep concern. He agonized over the church in Corinth. The Corinthians have to learn how to live as Christians in a deplorably wicked culture in the same way that we have to maintain a Christian witness in a deplorably wicked culture. And because of these problems, Paul obviously maintained community, communication with the church, writing letters back and forth with the church at Corinth. And those letters go beyond what we see in the New Testament. Look over with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And drop down to verse 9. And we have 1 Corinthians in our Bible, right? But Paul says in verse 9... I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. So Paul had written a letter to the Corinthian church before 1 Corinthians in which he told them not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Now he's writing 1 Corinthians to clear up confusion about his first letter, okay? Verse 10. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the coveters or with extortioners or idolaters. Since then you would need to go out of the world. But now, verse 11, in this letter, I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. Anyone who calls themselves a Christian and lives like that, you're not to keep company with them, all right? What this indicates then in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is that Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthians before 1 Corinthians that we, do, that we don't have. It's a lost letter, non-canonical, but Paul wrote a letter to them before 1 Corinthians. Now, think with me about the Corinthian correspondence here, and let's piece together what that involves. Scholars call the lost letter referenced in 1 Corinthians 5, they call it Corinthian A, Corinthian A. 1 Corinthians, then, the canonical letter that you have in your Bibles, in your New Testament, is called Corinthian B. Corinthian B. Look over at 1 Corinthians, chapter 16. Chapter 16. You following me so far? Hang in there. <laughs> like I said, it's going to be a little unusual today, a little different. <laughs> but hopefully, when we wrap this up, it'll be helpful to you. Lost letter... Corinthians A, 1 Corinthians in your New Testament, that's Corinthians B. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16, drop down to verse 5. Paul says in verse 5, now I will come to you, he's writing to the Corinthian church, and Paul says, I'm going to come to you when I pass through Macedonia, for I am passing through Macedonia, and it may be that I will remain or even spend a winter with you, that you may send me on my journey wherever I go. 
I don't wish to simply see you now on the way. In other words, I don't want to just spend a short amount of time with you in passing, verse 7, but I hope to stay a while with you if the Lord permits. But I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost. So Paul's in Ephesus when he writes this letter. He's going to tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. So Paul's in Ephesus. He's on his third missionary journey. He plans to come to Corinth again, but not simply in passing. He wants to spend some time with them. And so he plans to wait until after Pentecost when he's able to come and stay for a while. Look at verse 10. And if, that word for if there, better translated whenever. Paul's not certain of his arrival, but he sent Timothy to the church. So he says in verse 10, and whenever Timothy comes, see that he may be with you without fear, for he does the work of the Lord as I also do. Therefore, let no one despise him, but send him on his journey in peace that he may come to me, for I am waiting for him with the brethren. Now, Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, that he's already sent Timothy to them. It's apparent that when Paul heard the reports, the bad reports coming out of Corinth, that Paul immediately sends Timothy to the church to help. Paul's getting these reports and before he even writes, he sends Timothy, sends Timothy to the church. While Timothy is gone, headed toward Corinth through Macedonia, Paul receives a letter from the Corinthian church with questions from the church. Those questions are referenced in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul begins in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1, for example, now concerning the things of which you wrote to me. So there's some correspondence going back and forth between the church at Corinth and Paul. Paul writes a letter. The church at Corinth writes a letter back asking certain questions. Paul, hearing the reports from the church, sends Timothy to help. And while Timothy is away, the, the letter from the Corinthian church comes by the hand of Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus in chapter 16. While they are in Ephesus with Paul, he then writes Corinthians B which is 1 Corinthians' letter that we have in our New Testament. And he sends it back with Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaeus. Look down at verse 12. You're in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Look at verse 12. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urged him to come to you with the brethren, but he was quite unwilling to come at this time. However, he will come when he has a convenient time. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. I urge you, brethren, you know that the household of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and they have devoted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that you also submit to such and to everyone who works and labors with us. I am glad about the coming of Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus, for what was lacking on your part they supplied, for they refreshed my spirit and yours, therefore acknowledge such men. Okay? So let's put it together. According to 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, Paul planned on making a trip through Macedonia and spending some time in Corinth. Apparently, during the time that Paul spent three years across the Aegean in Ephesus, and likely at the return of Timothy, it became apparent that the situation in the Corinthian church was deteriorating. It was getting worse and worse. And so Paul then, at the deteriorating condition of the church, out of necessity, out of concern for the church, Paul makes what he refers to in 2 Corinthians as a painful visit, a visit that he did not want to have to repeat. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And in verse 1, the ESV says it this way, for I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. While Paul, during his three-year stay in Ephesus, at some point, Paul, out of concern for the church, makes a trip over to Corinth to deal with the problems in Corinth. It was a painful visit. Troublesome news about the church at Corinth had prompted the visit. And we know from chapter 12, chapter 13, in 2 Corinthians, that Paul's next planned visit to Corinth will be his third. So the visit to Corinth, this painful visit, didn't go well. Didn't go well. Paul goes back to Ephesus, devastated, distraught, 
And he writes from Ephesus what is called a sorrowful or severe letter. And this letter is first referenced in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, down in verse 3. Look at verse 3. And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came, I came for the third time, I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. So after the painful visit, Paul writes a severe or painful letter. This painful or severe letter, again, is lost to us, non-canonical. That's what scholars refer to as then Corinthians C. We have Corinthian A, Corinthian B, which is 1 Corinthians, Corinthian C, which is a severe letter, and the severe letter is lost to us, right? The severe letter carried by Titus to the Corinthian church. Let's put it together in summary, all right? See if you can keep this together. A lost letter written by Paul after he had planted the church, Corinthian A. The Corinthians respond with a letter of their own, asking many questions. Paul responds from Ephesus with 1 Corinthians, answering those questions, which scholars call Corinthian B. Things deteriorate in Corinth even further. And as bad as things appear to be from 1 Corinthians, they get worse in Corinth. And so Paul makes a painful visit, after which he writes a painful or severe letter from Ephesus, that's called Corinthians C. After Paul sends a severe letter by Titus to the church, the plan was for Paul to meet Titus in Troas. He wants to hear how the church responds. And he's waited, he's anticipating, right? He's very concerned. So he goes to Troas, that port city in Asia, and he's distressed because he doesn't find Titus there. So Paul immediately heads over to Macedonia, hoping to see Titus along the way. As he's traveling through Macedonia, he meets up with Titus, and here's the good news. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. He hears good news about the church in Corinth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. For indeed, Paul says, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts. Inside were fears. Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was comforted in you. When he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. For even if I made you sorry with my letter... I do not regret it, even though I didn't want to, right? For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice, verse 9, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance, for you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us and nothing. So it's upon this good news from Titus in Macedonia in 55 or 56 A.D., that Paul then writes the glorious letter that will occupy the attention of this church for the next couple of years. And that's the letter, 2 Corinthians. Writes his second letter to the Corinthians. Amen. I'm excited too. (laughs) That letter is 2 Corinthians. Now think with me for a moment. Why study 2 Corinthians? Why study 2 Corinthians? All of that history, all of that background leading up to Paul's final letter to this church in Corinth. One, because it's in the Bible. (laughs) It's in the Bible. And I don't mean that lightly, right? God's Word is amazing. Uh, It reveals His truth. It's amazing to think, right, in the wisdom of God, that God reveals His truth in a specific time, in a specific location, to a specific church. And it's that specific Redemptive historical truth that for us clarifies everything, right? It's to have impact on every square inch of our lives. You know, the Bible doesn't say much about quantum physics, does it? But the Bible, the Bible, God's Word, puts quantum physics in its appropriate context, amen? It has a lot to say, then, about quantum physics. The Bible puts this truth meant for this church at that time 
in such a way that it illuminates everything about our lives and what we are as a church and what we're to do, how we're to believe, how we're to obey. And so it gives clarity to our context, our life, the struggles that we face. And Second Corinthians just gloriously does that. Second reason to study Second Corinthians, among many, is some of the, the richest and most profound theology found anywhere in the Bible is found right here in Second Corinthians. The suffering and the Christian life. The relationship between law and gospel. The new covenant. The judgment seat of Christ for all believers. Particular redemption. Reconciliation. Justification. The doctrine of separation. Christian giving. Christian ministries. All packed into this letter. Thirdly, living the Christian life in Corinth is not unlike living the Christian life in America today. Uh, the, the letter to the Corinthians, the second letter here in our New Testament, 2 Corinthians, has much to teach us, and we have much to learn, right? Corinth was a highly sexualized, a highly sensual culture, extremely depraved. Home to the temple of Aphrodite with over a thousand temple prostitutes. People would flock to the temple to worship through prostitution, their idol, and the, the temple prostitutes would go down into the city and trade their wares in the city of Corinth on a regular basis. Corinth became known for that. Highly sensualized. Corinth was heavily into sports, heavily into entertainment. They had the Isthmian Games there. Uh, the theater held 18,000. Concert hall held 3,000 in Corinth. The largest segment of the populace were freedmen from Rome. Freedmen from Rome were like gold rush panners in California, right? The people that supposedly were self-made millionaires, self-made men that pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps. One commentator uh, called First and Second Corinthians, First and Second Californians. <laughs> we could also call it First and Second Floridians, right? Full of pride, full of ambition, full of greed, full of corruption. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul described the Corinthian Christians, he described the Corinthian Christians as having once been fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. And Paul said, and such were some of you. Right? But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So 2 Corinthians is a lot like America, a lot like our culture. We have much to learn. As a basic outline to the letter, if you want to make notes in the margin of your Bible in preparation for next week, 2 Corinthians can be divided into three major sections. Three major sections. Section 1, runs from chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 7, verse 16. Paul, in chapter 1 through chapter 7, Paul deals practically with his proposed travel plans through Macedonia to Corinth. And more directly, though, Paul deals with his past interaction with the church at Corinth. There is a tremendous, in that section, there's this tremendous middle section from chapter 2, verse 14, through chapter 7, verse 4. It's a parenthesis, if you will, where Paul elucidates or explains new covenant gospel ministry. And it is chock full of just godly, living, breathing theology. And it's going to be a tremendous joy for us to go through that section. Uh, the section ends with a beautiful encouragement to the Corinthian church in chapter 7, verse 16. Therefore, Paul says, I rejoice that I have confidence in you and everything. That ends section 1. Section 2 chapters 8 and 9. Chapters 8 and 9 where Paul makes an appeal for the Corinthian church to follow the example of their poorer Macedonian brothers and sisters and give to the collection for the famine-stricken saints in Jerusalem. That's section 2, chapters 8 and 9. And section 3, chapters 10 through 13. Where in chapters 10 through 13, Paul addresses his opponents. There were false apostles or super apostles, false teachers that invaded the church at Corinth and they were laboring to slander Paul, to slander gospel ministry, to, to destroy his influence. And Paul is forced to defend himself. And in defending himself, 
We have some of the best teaching in all the New Testament on defending or the nature of apostolic gospel ministry. Gospel ministry. We're called to preach the gospel. We're going to hear about that in chapters 10 through 13. Now you'll notice several beautiful strands that are woven through the fabric of this letter. Themes that recur as you read through it. And I want to encourage you to begin reading through 2 Corinthians. One of those themes is that Christian suffering is a means through which God is glorified. We're going to learn about that as we work through the, through the letter. Man's weakness. Man's weakness is a means by which God is manifested in power. Where God's strength is manifested and in that God is glorified. And I'm going to give you one example. One example before we begin our study in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 1 next week. And this comes to us from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look there with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and drop down to verse 7. Just an amazing text, an astounding text. Why I look forward in about a year or so to get to this section of Scripture (laughs) and work through this text. Uh, It's going to be a joy. Look at verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake. That the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then, death is working in us, but life in you. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, brother and sister, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, that's what Paul describes as the the troubles that we face, the difficulties that we face, is just light affliction. They faced difficulties far more drastic than we do, and to them it was light affliction, light affliction. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, that's how long our lives are, a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Amen. All praise, honor, and glory be to the one, right, who gives us this treasure in earth and vessels. Let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for this time to study your word. I thank you for this letter. Thank you for the joy and the blessing and the privilege that we have uh, to week by week Um, exposit these texts and dive into this letter to dig out the treasures that you've laid there for us. And we are grateful to you for that blessing. I pray, Lord, that as you so graciously blessed in our study through the Gospel of John, that you would bless us now, Lord, as we study this letter, this revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, by the pen of Paul to the church at Corinth. I pray that you would bless us now as we study this letter together. Bless these truths to our heart or prepare our heart and mind to come faithfully to hear your word preached, to apply the truths that we see here to our own lives, to live, Lord, in light of the truth that you expound here in this letter, to glory, to glorify you for your glory, God, and for our good I pray, Lord, Spirit of God, you would guide us into truth, protect us from error, strengthen us, comfort us, help us, Lord, to understand. Spur us on to faithfulness, to be a faithful witness. We believe, therefore we speak. I pray, Lord, you would apply those truths to our heart. 
Give us comfort knowing that we are never forsaken. And help us, Lord, as we go through this letter to trust in you more, to love you more, to obey you more faithfully. And Lord, I just carry us on from faith to faith as you've been so gracious to do. We love you. Lord, thank you for this letter. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this church. Mostly, Lord, thank you for Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.